Hey, let's open in prayer. Father, we come to you, and you're sovereign, and we acknowledge all your goodness and provision to our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Uh, in the, in, during the worship service, in, in the first service, and I want to say this to the parents. I'm saying this to us and to the parents. Uh, and, or, but God is churning. And that's what I just said. I feel it oftentimes that God is churning in the hearts uh, of people. And I just sense that in the hearts of those who've there, where there's been a deposit of the word of God. But for whatever reasons, the people have pulled back. They've hardened their hearts. But God is churning. And he is just churning up, and that deposit of the Word of God is coming alive and becoming afresh. And, and, and that's called conviction in some circles, you know. It's just called conviction. They begin to feel like, what's going on? Something's happening. And so you parents, have, some of you have been praying. Some of you see desperate situations. But God is hearing your prayers. Your prayers are hear, heard in heaven. Thank you. And, and God is churning. He sees where that Word has been deposited and it is working in their lives. And how many can in their own life testify to that kind of an experience? Something has been deposited in you, and you've kind of thought, I can ignore that. But sooner or later, God starts calling that, that word out. He starts churning it. Amen? Hey, turn to uh, Matthew 18. And we are in verse 10, 1810. Pastor Jeff sent me an email. He asked if I'd be available to preach, asked if I would be open to do that. And I said, sure. Uh, and as soon as I responded back, uh, he responded back to Dayton and confirmation that he got my email. Uh, I was just started praying. I said, Lord, what do I do? What, what do I say? And only one word just kind of rose up. And the word was meaning. It just kind of rose up in my spirit. It says, Meaning. Now, there's been times when I would much prefer to have the complete download. But when he just gives you one word, thank God, yeah, I got one word, meaning. But you know that people cannot exist without meaning. Everyone in here at some time or another, you have asked, why am I here? Can anyone relate to that? Who am I? Why am I here? Does my life have any purpose? Are you in the house? Everyone wonders that. Is there meaning to anything? And our youth today, there has been such a void of the Word of God and the willingness to allow the Spirit of the Word of God to work that in our culture, we've got an entire generation of people who are questioning meaning. And we have a, a rising up in the culture of this other counter-belief saying, well, we're just a product of evolution. And if we're just a product of evolution, there is no ultimate meaning. And so you get a, 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 he's not even a philosopher, actually, he's a, bio, he's a biologist, uh, Richard Dawkins and, uh, uh, Dawkins, and he would say something to this, this extent that uh, there is no point asking the question of meaning. What's the point? There is no meaning. There's no meaning to the, uh, the, to the question. We just are. Forget about it. There's nothing to, to worry about. Just to show you how ludicrous the argument can get, I'm going to read you a quote, and this is not a joke. This is how the people are actually thinking. And so this person writes in, in a blog, and this blog was published in Psychology Today, and this is what it says, and I quote, most, and I'll say it again, you might think that I'm reading something that a guy meant as a joke, but this isn't. This is his mindset. Quoting, most people can live perfectly happy lives even while accepting that life has no ultimate meaning. At least once they get used to the idea. Some even cheerfully accept that life is meaningless and view it as amusing in a strange kind of way. A cosmic joke, but without a joke teller. The very quote itself makes absolutely no sense in his thinking. But we are living, we need meaning, and without a meaning in our lives, we don't survive. We turn to the drugs, we turn to the alcohol, we turn to relationships outside of a relationship with God and outside of a, a godly direction for my, and purpose for my relationship. Nothing's worse to try to find meaning in somebody else who in themselves are looking for meaning. But it's happening all the time. 
we try to find meaning in some relationship, and that person is trying to find meaning in some relationship, and those two people who don't sense any real meaning hook up, and they're frustrated after a while. And they wonder what's wrong. And then they start to pray, and then, you know, God gets blamed for a lot. They, they go to God, and they start to pray, and they ask God for all kinds of things. And how come God's not answering? It's not just a, me- a question of meaning, but it's a question of relationship. And the very meaning that we're asked when we ask the question, does my life mean anything, is not a philosophical question. It's a question of relationship. And the only way I can really know that my life means anything is when I'm in a relationship where I am valued, where someone has a, is concerned with my well-being. And so when I use the word meaning, I am talking of purpose. I am talking of significance. I'm talking to something. I'm hesitant to say the word value because that is not quite what I mean, but there's something profoundly real that I'm experiencing. And I do place a high value on that. But God, when God gets a hold of our lives, it reveals the meaning to us. We have to have meaning revealed to us. We have to have the meaning even communicated to us. And when we receive it, we go, oh, God, I mean something. If you have never received uh, Jesus Christ, this message is for you. If you have received Jesus Christ into your heart, but you're kind of feeling you get kind of uh, sideways, a little lost in what you mean anything, this word is for you. I pray that the spirit of the word goes deep into your spirit. That the spirit of the word would bypass the intellect and you'll receive it in your heart. I've kind of gotten out of the habit. uh, The Lord began to really show me that when I'm being prayed for, and I've had, just as some others have too, some powerful, powerful people just pray for me. That's not, I'm not boasting, I'm just saying this is a fact. Pray for me, and they were just and being taught in the Word of God. He says, now as you're praying, you just say, I receive. I receive this. And, and of course, I am so, sometimes so in my head, I've got to figure everything out, you know. Oh, what is going to happen? How is God going to do this? What, is God gonna, what does that mean? And then says, you just stop, you start receiving bypass the head, get down to your spirit. Let the word of God be in your spirit. Tell yourself, I receive. I'm not going to say anything, but believe me, I'm not going to say anything unbiblical. You just receive what I'm going to say. If it doesn't make any sense right at the moment, just receive it and let God work. Believe me, if I said anything dumb, weird, sideways, anything, uh, the microphone, and rightly so, should be from walk right up to me and says, I'll take that. Thank you very much. Because that's what I would do. Fortunately, we've got the Word of God abiding in the house. Spirit of God in the house. Amen. Are you in Matthew 18? Meaning means that someone has taken a special interest in me. Now, my wife took a special interest in me. I've taken a special interest in her. But we're both looking for meaning. (laughs) And I can't come to my wife who's looking for meaning to find meaning in someone who's looking for meaning. And she won't find it in me. But maybe you're here and you're looking for meaning in somebody. Somebody here. Somebody out there. God has a different plan for you. Here we go. Matthew 18. Verse 10. And I'll read down through 14. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. I'm going to tell you about that in a moment. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? There is a question. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray. And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. 
We're talking about meaning. Someone has taken a special interest in me. There are places I have worked, I do work in a prison, and if there's one place where you wonder if there's a meaning to life, you see people in despair. You see people that are filled with shame. Shame could be the one thing that just undermines our meaning. The pain that we can go through can cause us to question our meaning. Sometimes we can get so, maybe not less lost in sin, but we can get lost in just our own confusion of who we are and what God has for us. So I'm talking to someone who may not have known Jesus, but I've just been around long enough to know that sometimes we just get ourselves messed up, even though we do know God. And someone is taking a special interest in you. In me? In you. That's the whole idea of meaning. So in the beginning, so he says that do see to it that you do not despise one of these little ones. Well, just prior, just prior to this, uh, the group of people that Jesus was with. And there was a crowd around him. And some of those special insiders, they came to Jesus because they were his inside group. They were called the disciples. And they came to him. And they said, Jesus, who's going to be the greatest when we get to heaven in the kingdom of God? And Jesus is looking at these guys. Can you imagine coming to Jesus I mean, and saying, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? The greatest was already there. But they just didn't know it. That's someone who takes a special interest in you. You can totally blow it. And they go, I'm still investing in you guys. But Jesus turns to them. And he looks around and he sees some little children. And he calls the children over to him. And whether or not he kneels down or he picks them up, he says, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven. Now I'm going to translate that. Not great in that you're above and above, the head and shoulders above others. Because you know what? There is not that kind of greatness in the kingdom of heaven. There's not some that rise above and we're just better. We are all the same. The path at the cross is level. And when I come to the cross, whether I'm with, stand up, can you? We're both, we are both the same height at the cross. And the need that I have is exactly the same need that Kenyon has. And so he holds up this little child and says, if you want to become great, in other words, if you want to be like me, because there's only one person God can compare himself to. He's not compare us amongst ourselves. That's pathetic. <laughs> he says, if you want to be great, in other words, if you want to walk with me, you want to hang out with me, you want to know me and the meaning and the significance of real greatness, you're going to have to become like one of these children. Because children, we don't become childish, and we don't start acting like little kids. Oh, well, maybe some of you do, but we're not supposed to. <laughs> but we are to have that childlike faith, that childlikeness. We have a grandson, and he's adorable, and I could tell him the moon is made out of cheese and brown cows make chocolate milk. And he would say, okay. <laughs> they just believe. They receive what is being told. But we, have, we are a little different. We've been burned. We're a little doubtful. I've had people say they really have my interest in heart, and they haven't had my interest of heart. And to be honest, I have told people that I have their interest of heart, and I have not had their interest at heart. It's a two-way street. I'm as guilty as the next worst sinner out there. So are you. You don't feel good? Come just tell you you're just a sinner. You know, I'm just as miserable as the worst of them, and so are you. But meaning is not an argument. Meaning is not something that's out there that I'm trying to convince that I am. Meaning is something that is revealed to me. Meaning can only be had when there's a relationship. And in a relationship with someone who treats me as though I'm special and there is purpose and there is a plan and there's something for my life that counts. 
And so he takes that little one and says, now you become like that child. And I want to say, receive the spirit of the word into your life. Receive it into your heart. Receive it into your spirit. If I make absolutely no sense to anybody up here, I know one thing for sure. Everything I'm telling you is the word of God. And the word of God will go inside of you. And the Holy Spirit, and he knows what to do with the word of God. <laughs> I mentioned in the, the first service that sometimes I, I there's, there's just a hunger rising up in me. A hunger for God, a hunger for the word. I love the word. And, and the hunger for it. And I, was, I just told Gene today, I, I know you related when I mentioned you're going to hear it again, but I told Gene this morning, I said, honey, I, just, I feel like I just don't know anything. I read the Bible, and I get a hold of something, and I think, oh, that is so rich, so good. And then I'm thinking, how does, and I'm looking around, and front of, I feel like I'm just fumbling through the Scripture. I'm fumbling through my knowledge. And I'm like drooling, I'm, uh, you know. But I'm hungry for it. I used to, before I would condemn myself, but now I go, God, I'm hungry for it. That's what that is inside of me. That's what's going on. I'm hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And he goes, Ken, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So a man has a hundred, a man has a hundred sheep. Well, it's not a far stretch to begin to realize Jesus is really not talking about sheep. He's not. Well, he's concerned about sheep. He's concerned about all of his creation. But he's not talking about sheep. Because they came to them, and it was these disciples, the special group of people. They set the context for the whole conversation. Who's going to be the greatest? And Jesus just picked up on that and says, well, look at these children. Then he turns around and says, listen, if a man has 100 sheep, now we're talking about sheep. No, we're not. We're talking about people. But this is what he reveals to them. What do you think? And that question needs to be answered today. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? Question. And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Here's the point that Jesus is saying. People are the priority. They came and said, who's going to be the greatest? And Jesus says, no, you guys, have, the whole premise is off. People are the priority. He wants to evaluate our lives. He wants to inspect our lives, but he's looking at the flock, as you will. He's looking at the people. He's looking at the nations. He's looking at the cities. He's looking at the schools. He's looking into this church, sanctuary, this church. He's looking into Marysville. He's looking into families, and he says, is everybody accounted for? Is everybody here? I am calling, and those who hear my calling, he's taking special interest in. And he evaluates our life. It's not fun to have God evaluate your life sometimes. Even when you are so humble and you invite him to come and evaluate your life, you go, whoa, wait a minute. But he evaluates our life. And then he has the audacity to ask us what we think of it. <laughs> then you go, are you serious? What do I think about you evaluating my life? But God has a, looks at us differently in the way we look at ourselves. He really does. We look at ourselves and we can get to know one another and we get to know our strengths and things and weaknesses and pretty soon we get to know each other well enough we go, oh man, this person is a mess. I'm a mess. We look at ourselves and we can look at ourselves with condemnation. We look at ourselves and we see the faults and we think we're going to surge forward and do the best and we find out it just so falls short so miserably. But God doesn't look at us that way. 
He evaluates and he knows the things we struggle with. He knows us intimately. But he is still examining. He still looks. Are you my believer? Am I your shepherd, your savior? Stay with the analogy. Are you mine? Do you belong to me? I am calling and I'm searching. So people are the priority to God. And he counts us. And he's concerned when we're missing. I had a good friend uh, who passed away and had had the privilege. And it really was just pure privilege and joy, even though it was grieving for the loss of him. I had a chance to officiate the funeral yesterday. And, but, but John uh, was a, just a neat guy. He, he was talented. And he was the kind of guy you got around him. He was just funny. He was just one of these naturally funny guys. And uh, so many people stood up and just testified and talked about him. And I just sat there and just realized I, I was glad I knew him for the time that I was able to know him. That I had that small part of interaction with his life and so many people had a part of him. And we were in our early 20s. We'd just gotten saved, but in separate places. But we, our lives connected at the same church. And, man, we used to pray together. We encouraged one another. I would cry on his shoulder. And, and uh, he was kind of tall. He would kind of hard for him to get down to my shoulder. But, uh, he, but I would cry on him, probably more on his chest. You know, but uh, John, he was awesome. But through events, through situations, Years later, call it two decades. That's a long time, you know, 20 years. He relapses and goes back to his alcohol and stuff. And his life just kind of was into a mess. And he had so abused alcohol all his life until he got saved, and, and, but uh, so abused it that it just destroyed his body. Really, he just, he just, just died from all the damage to his body. And God found that man, found him then, he goes astray, and God finds him again. Because he's searching and looking, and he found him. And when I would go visit him, I would just would pray one time, and he would just have this power, he'd just feel the God, power of God on him. And rather than just asking, John, are you ready to go with Jesus? I just say, John, do you remember? Do you remember what it was like? Some of those prayer meetings, some of those men's meetings that we were in, Bible studies, he goes, yeah, I do. He said, but I'm afraid, I don't know what's going to happen. He said, oh, John, God knows. God knows. You've asked him to forgive you, God knows. Went on, as soon as I heard that he had died, and they called me on the phone and says, John passed away at, uh, I think it was Tuesday, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. And just as soon as I hung up the phone, just in myself, and I know this is, just, this is kind of a subjective thing, but just in myself, I just knew he just slipped right into the, the hands. He fell, really, he just fell into the arms of Jesus. See, he does not, God does not want one to perish. That's meaning. Not only perish from everlasting life, but he doesn't want us to perish in the fruit in our life. He doesn't want us to perish from a love and the significance and the knowledge that I have meaning. None of this he wants to see perish. And so he seeks us out. He calls us out. So in John 14, 6, Jesus is talking. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Remember, we're all his priority. And if we are if we are his priority, then he has given us a way in which he can communicate with us. He says, I am the way. And when he says, I am the way, there's nothing tricky about that word. You look it up and through the Greek dictionary, there's nothing tricky about the word. It literally means way. I am the path. I am the avenue or I am the idea that I am the one whom which you will find what you are longing for. I am the way. A person. 
But then he says, not only am I the way, I am the truth. And it's this idea of truth continues right on. It's not something just so abstract that I intellectually have got to grasp and study and labor. But rather, it's a truth that is revealed to me through a person who is truth. So I might be in with Gene or my family or here or at work, and if I am thinking that I'm really, you know, being that great godly man and I'm coming at, at a situation my way and everything just kind of falls apart, and Jesus says, uh, that was your truth. That wasn't the truth. Have you ever thought you, you'd just go and do something you knew, knew God wanted you to do it? And then when everything didn't work out, you go, what happened? And God says, you probably should have come and consulted me first. I am the truth. And I am the life. And it's the same thing. He is the life. Apart from him, I have no life. Apart from him, I'm nothing. I'm going, Lord, is there any reason for life? Is there anything good going on? Does my life have any purpose? And he shows up and says, dude, I'm here. What's wrong with you? What's this question? Does your life have any purpose? Is your sin too big? Is your shame too, too much? Is the pain you're going through too much for God? You see, meaning is not discovered intellectually. Meaning is discovered when he's present in my heart. And I'm his priority. And I adjust my life to make him my priority. Well, you know, if we are God's priority for this relationship, there's a problem first and foremost. The problem that the Bible calls sin, but it is another issue just within us. I'm going to give you a definition of sin. As one evangelist, Steve Hill, once said, sin is just anything that Jesus wouldn't do. That's sin. Now, when you were in that Steve Hill service in Brownsville, that time of that movement, you probably remember to call that stuff, and they give us sin is anything that Jesus would, wouldn't do, and you're sitting in that kind of that atmosphere, and the says, oh, man, the altar's are always full. Oh, anything that Jesus wouldn't do, I wouldn't even know some of the things that Jesus wouldn't do. And I'm just feeling like, hey, i got to go repent. But Paul would say it this way. He says, whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks. But sin is that which just causes shame and pain in me. If I'm ashamed, if I'm in pain by it, I better figure that I'm missing out on the relationship. I'm missing out on the truth of what I am and the truth of what he's really doing inside of me. So there's this problem of sin. Gene, I'm going to need you to come up. I had Mark. Mark's not here in the first service. He was here in the first service. He's not here this one. But there was this problem. And the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many have sinned? All. Yeah, all of you. All. Me. All, all. Me. I'm included. You're pointing at me. What? What's going on? <laughs> I, me too. No problem. I have sinned many times. And I'll probably sin. I, probably, I'll sin before the day is over. And when I climb in the bed, I go, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins today. Every night, I might miss a few nights. So I'm not going to puff myself up. But there is a lot of nights. I climb in the bed. Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. The sins I know. Oh, Lord, that was a sin. That was a sin. Forgive me for that. But God, there's things I did or said I don't even know. Forgive that too. Isn't that good? See, so he's my way, the truth, and the life. But that sin problem has to be taken care of. If all have sinned, and we, apparently everyone in here agrees that, yeah, I've sinned, that creates a separation between us and God. Because God won't draw near to sin. He's separated from us. Because I am having the sin inside of me. So if you use hands like that, let's just say my cell phone represents the sin. And it's in me. Well, 2 Corinthians 5, 
uh, 21, I think. I have it in my notes, but I'm so out of my notes now. That in 521, it said, Paul says that God made him, with reference to Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might know the righteousness of God, meaning the right way of God, the right ways of God. And he puts it in me. And so he took Jesus on the cross, and he took all my sin, and say, all my sin. How much of your sin? How much? All of it. The sin you're ashamed of, the sin that's caused you pain, uh, even some of the sin that you're still hanging on to and you're not ashamed of it. Even that sin. Might as well go the extra mile. The sin you're still thinking you can get away with. <laughs> and he takes it and he puts it on Christ who's dying on the cross. But he knew no sin. He was always in the right ways of God and never out of the right ways of God. So he who knew no sin had something that you and I don't have. He came and he brought it to the cross. And it says in the book of Acts that the grave could not hold him because he had no sin. And so our sin is in Christ on the cross. But after his death, he took his, his unique, his special relationship he had with God and he put it over our sin. And then he carried it, our sin away. Thank you. So, though I'm lost, and though I'm his priority, he has a special solution to the problem. Priority, problem, solution. God has a solution for your problem. Not only that, the promise that he gives us, I'll read the scripture verse, for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself, that though, and I'm going to paraphrase this because there's several ideas within this scripture, it says that all who should call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. All. Thank you, Dan. The scripture verse was 2 Corinthians 5.21. I quoted it to you, but I just want to give it to you for sure. 5.21. God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. But not only are we his priority, and not only even though there is a problem, he gives a solution because there is a promise for every problem. So not only do we have the promise, there is a plan. And the plan that he has for us is a plan that he would take his spirit and put inside of us. And the spirit of God indwells me. Come on, now, I am, really am preaching just basic gospel. Just, really, just a straight-up salvation message. But I appreciate it as we were talking this morning that I was saved, but I am being saved, and I am going to be fully saved when I fall into the arms of Jesus. So I am really, the God, this message is a living word, let it go into your heart. Don't get all intellectual and say, oh, yeah, I know about all this. Because if you're up there thinking that, you don't know as you ought to know. Receive it in your spirit. I'm his priority. Yeah, I've got problems, but he's the solution to my problems. He's the solution because there's a promise given to me. And with that promise, he never, never breaks a promise. 
That's why I can learn, and it is learning to come to him in childlikeness. Because I have been disappointed in my trust, but in God, he has not disappointed my trust. My problems with God has not been what God has done for me. My problems with God is what I, I have treated God. But Jesus has his plan. And we, that he would live in us, and we would know the depth of his forgiveness. We cannot make the forgiveness of God something academic or something theological that we think that when I just confess, he forgives me, and that's it. The forgiveness of God is everything. The blood of Jesus shed for me, and when he takes away my sin, he takes away the very thing that separates me in my shame. It's gone. I might carry the guilt, but God doesn't. That means if God's plan is I come to him anytime. His door is open. When I was in the Air Force years ago, year, yeah, years ago, uh, the commander of my squadron uh, said, my door, I have an open door policy. My door is open. And if it was closed, then that means that he's going to meet them. But basically, my door is open. That means anyone in my, assigned to my squadron, when they want to have access to me, they can just go to the first sergeant, speak, says, I want to see the commander, and they have access to him. God has an open door policy. His door is always open. He says to his heavenly angels, says, when they come in, they want direct access right now. So God's plan is that I would learn God reside in me. That I would learn to let the Spirit of God show me and reveal to me my meaning, my purpose. That the Spirit of God would forgive me. And that forgiveness would be so deeply ingrained and real in my spirit that I let go of my shame. I let go of guilt. I let go of what I want to hang on to, and I began to live back up in the high priority of God. Oh, I didn't even think about it <laughs> till now. That I can live back up in the high priority of God. I'm receiving revelation as I'm preaching. I didn't even see it. I'm his priority. And I got problems, but he has a solution because there's a promise. And his plan is, you come right back up to the top of my high priority. Me? Yeah, can you? Don't you ask me what your meaning is, Ken. Okay, I won't. <laughs> you just keep your eye on Jesus. We are his priority. Amen. Amen.